All right, good morning, everyone. You know, it's been a while since we had our session in lifestyle evangelism. Uh, let's just uh, pray and uh, we'll get into our teaching session today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time, Lord, you've given us. Lord, we pray that even as we study and learn from your word, we pray that you will speak and minister to our hearts, oh God. We just, uh, Lord, lay our hearts to you, we speak to our hearts, and we commit this time into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we begin with chapter 7. Is that right? Start wherever you want to start from. Chapter 7 or chapter 8? We finished chapter 7. Who said chapter 8? Okay, no worry. Let's get into chapter 7. Okay, so it looks like we'll have to go a little quick, but this session, let's try and look at chapter 7 and chapter 8 and see uh, if we can do as much as we can, right? Okay, chapter 7. Um, chapter 6, we looked at, now let's just go back and see what we did in chapter 6. We looked at invite and pray, uh, pointing based on trust. Remember we talked about it? How John the Baptist pointed his disciples to Jesus, Andrew pointed Peter to Jesus, so even you and I can point people to Christ. And, and so this chapter, we look at how to connect with people and make an impact in their lives. Do we have to connect with people? When two friends meet together, what do we say? Hey, let's connect next week. Yes? Or we are, uh, let's connect for cell group. Let's, let's connect in the church. Now we're going to pick up from the example of John chapter 4 where Jesus is on his ministry. He's going to a certain place and on the way he meets with the Samaritan woman. We know the story. Yes. So John chapter 4, Jesus is going. He sends his disciples, go bring food. And he meets with the Samaritan woman. And let's look at this portion of scripture and see how the Lord Jesus set an example of connecting with people and making an impact of, of their lives. Now, a lot of these points may be, a few of them may be repeated, but we'll go really quick in those areas, right? Okay, number one, be open for divine setups. From Jerusalem to Galilee through Samaria is a three days journey. Jesus and his disciples came to this place called Sychar, and in the district of Samaria, Jesus went and sat at Jacob's well. Now, look at these two things now. You think of it naturally, you think of it supernaturally or spiritually. Naturally, it's a three days journey. Jesus is thirsty. What does he need? Water. Now, the closest place that he can go was Jacob's well, so he goes and sits there. Now, in the natural, he wants water. But in the spiritual, there is a reason why he went and sat there. Right? The reason, another reason was he knew, as, as a son of God, he knew what was going to happen there. He knew who's going to come. He knew everything. But he was ready for a divine setup from God the Father. So the opportunity came to meet this Samaritan woman. And at the well was a divine setup. Set up. It was not pre-planned. Now Jesus didn't plan it in the sense that, okay, she will come. I will talk like this. No. The woman came to take water. What did Jesus do? He began to connect with her. Jesus could have minded, her own, minded his own business and said, can you please give me some water? She would have said yes. He would have drank the water. He would have gone and sat, you know, I want some quietness. Gone and sat under the tree and waited for the disciples. Could he have done that? Yes. But he chose to connect. Now, let's look at what Jesus himself had to push past certain inhibitions. Now, remember, Jesus was walking in his sonship glory. That means he was a person. He, he, he was tired. He was physically tired, probably mentally tired. Right? But what are some of the inhibitions that 
could have stopped Jesus from talking to this Samaritan woman. Number one, he was tired. How many of you like to talk when you're tired? I, for one, don't like to talk. Sometimes, you know, we do. We go for these conferences and all of it. We, you know, there'll be times when the the line is so long, and you've sat, you stood there, you've prayed for more than one hour for everyone, and then you go back to your rooms or your, right? And then sometimes people want to talk to you still. Say no, tired. I, I need to rest. Now rest is important, but here Jesus decided. Even though I'm tired, I need to step out. I need to connect with this person. Two, he was a Jew and she was a Samaritan. Now, in Eastern culture, this was a big deal. You know why? OK. Did I give you the history of the Samaritans and the Jews? Did you No? OK. See, here's what happened. There were Jews before this, they were getting married to the Samaritans. Now, the Samaritans were people who worshipped a god on a mountain. right? So they were basically Gentile worshippers. Now, Jews were getting married to these Samaritans, and it was a crossbreed. So what were they doing, the Samaritans? They will go to the Jewish temple, pray to God, but they will also go to the mountain and pray to the idol. They were doing both. So the Jews were very, very upset and angry with these people. History says that to avoid Samaria, they will go a roundabout route just to avoid getting into that city. It is also said that they, they, they were treated worse than dogs in a way that they didn't even want to smell the breath of the Samaritans. So there was such a communal difference between them. If a Jew and a Samaritan are together, firstly, they won't be together. But if that's the case, the Jew hates the Samaritans because they took this God and they've mixed this God with another God. So there was extreme hatredness. You get the picture now, right? Now, Jesus is saying here, he's a Jew. And this is a Samaritan. So I don't need to talk to her at all. Right? As, a, as a Jew, I am more superior than a Samaritan. Three, he was a man and this was a lady. Now, again, in Eastern culture, women would normally go out in the afternoons during those times when not many people are outside because women were considered kind of a lower class. They were not given priority in Jewish, in Jewish customs, in Samaritans, and you know, normally women were not given priority. It was always the men. Now look at what Jesus did. Firstly, he was tired. Secondly, he's a Jew, she's a Samaritan. Thirdly, it's a Samaritan woman. So three reasons why not to talk to the Samaritan woman, but Jesus puts aside all those inhibitions and connects with her. Jesus explained what made, motivated him to break past these inhibitions. He lived to do the Father's will and to carry out the Father's work. The will of the Father was that everyone should be saved. So now you've got Jesus and he's... His desire is to speak to her to bring the gospel of Jesus, bring the gospel to her. Two, every person is harvestable and ready to be reached. And think of this. Remember that uh, parable which Jesus spoke of? The good Samaritan. Imagine Jesus is standing there. He's teaching the people, the disciples. And says, okay, let me tell you a story. There was a good Samaritan. No, no, no. You started wrong. Samaritans are not good. Samaritans are people who have destroyed the culture of Jews. So they're not good. But when Jesus ministered, he ministered beyond our thinking. He understood that every person is harvestable. Meaning, I can invest in this person's life because we don't know what he or she can become. 
And Jesus thought of it that way. This may be a simple Samaritan woman. Nobody knows her. Nobody recognizes her. Nobody even cares about her. But in Jesus' eyes, she is going to be the person who will bring the gospel to the entire village. He understood that every person is harvestable. Thirdly, we are gathering fruit for eternal life. And as we, as we will rejoice together in the future, our goal is to gather fruit for eternal life. Four, sometimes we sow, others reap. Sometimes others sow, others sow and we reap. It's a very important principle that we must learn in ministry especially. We, we sow into people's lives, others may reap it. And there are times others will sow and we reap it. Let me give you an example. In church history, there was this one man. His name was Robert Mary McShane. And he was praying for revival for many years in his church. Many, many years, 10 years, 15 years. And after about 20 years of praying, he, he had an injury, so he had to take a break. So when he took a break, he went away from the town uh, from the city that he was living in and they appointed one young man his name is wc burns he was only 26 years old right this 26 year old came and started preaching on sundays now all of a sudden a church which was robert murray mcshane's church had about 300 people all of a sudden people started coming to the church 500 800 thousand thousand five hundred two thousand 2,500, 3,000. In a span of about two to three years, the church became 5,000 people. Now, this poor guy, W.C. Burns, he's thinking, what am I doing? Nothing I'm doing. I'm just preaching. He has no idea for why so many people are coming. And the reason was somebody else paid the price. Somebody else sowed. And he was reaping the benefits. And in ministry especially, when there will be times when we will sow into people's lives, somebody else may reap the benefit. But remember, there's eternal fruit and there's eternal reward for that. Right? Uh, these are the same things that should motivate us to connect with people and share with people. So how, do we con how did Jesus connect with this woman? Started with something that she was doing and something that she could relate to. Let's go to John chapter 4. Let's open that. Let's look at that entire conversation. Open to John chapter 4. Now, when verse 7, and we'll just pick up uh, portions from here, right? John chapter 4 and verse 7. Okay. It says here, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her. So who made the first attempt to speak? Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? Now, why did the woman come there? To fill water. So Jesus asked something simple, connected with her. Can you give me some water to drink? This is not some big spiritual thing that Jesus said. Jesus then say, didn't say, okay, woman, what's your name? Oh. I am the Messiah. I was the one who was sitting with the Father in heaven, and I created the heavens and the earth. I created water. But right now, because of I am in sonship glory, and I am the Son of God, but I'm walking here on earth for a reason, so I'm feeling thirsty. Since I'm feeling thirsty, can you please give me some water? Did Jesus say all that? Simple thing. Can you give me some water? What does it teach us? Speak only what is needed. Sometimes we go into stories and people are not interested in our stories. But we like to... Have you heard of... Have you been with people? They keep speaking. And I sometimes have told people, I'll pay you to keep quiet. Just keep quiet. Don't talk. 
not in a harsh way. No, just, of course, there are people that I know of. I, I would tell them, just keep quiet, no. Just, just try to not speak. It's a blessing to keep quiet also. There are people who keep talking, continuously talking. There's a time to talk, there's a time not to talk. Right? But look at Jesus. He spoke and he spoke to the point. Can you give me some water to drink? He asked her for water to drink. Then what did Jesus do? Very important. He stirred the conversation from simple daily thing to spiritual things. What did he do? Let's see here. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan. How come you ask me for a drink? Look at that. The NIV says, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So the woman is saying, hey, hold on. If, if it was any other Jew, it is okay if they fall and die also. But I will not ask a Samaritan to, for water. But how is it that you, being a Jew, know that I'm a Samaritan and you're asking me for water? Now, Jesus stirs the conversation to another direction, from the natural to the spiritual. Jesus answered and said, if you know, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks for you, asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. How beautifully Jesus stirred that conversation. Can you give me some water? Now, I always think the other way. What if the woman said, yeah, sure, come. Do you have any pot? I said, no, I, do. I don't have a pot. How can you ask me for water without a pot? I said, then maybe the conversation would have gone. I am, I am the potter. You are the clay. How is that? You're not even a potter. Then maybe Jesus would have used that to bring it into a spiritual aspect. But yeah, she only asked, right? Jesus took the conversation from water and said, if you knew who's asking this, that who's asking for water, he would have given you eternal life or, 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 or a water or, or a living water. Now, look at what happens after that. Verse 11, sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? You, first of all, you, you have come empty-handed. Secondly, you don't have a pot. Thirdly, you need to drink water. You're asking me, and then you're saying you're giving me living water. Where do I get this living water from? So you see the way he's stirring the conversation, right? Engage with people based on things they can relate to. Stir the conversation to talk about spiritual things. Now, this is an ability that we will gain as we keep doing this uh, often, right? Some things to be cautious about. Uh, yeah, if you're engaging with a person from a, of the opposite sex, do not get emotionally involved. Do not cross moral boundaries. Be careful not to interfere with personal life matters and choices. Very important. Now, when you and I are ministering to people, right, don't get involved in their personal matters. And this is something that we are, you know, I've noticed in churches and pastors in different places, especially in rural uh, and village settings, where the pastors make every decision for the family. Right? My daughter is 20 years old. Get her married. My son wants to go abroad. No, don't go abroad. You give that money to the church, God will give a better opportunity. Making decisions for the... No. We, we As leaders, we must understand that there is... A personal life of people, and we don't involve in it. There's the personal, that's the spiritual. Our, our goal in life is to raise up people spiritually. Now, in while we're doing that, people may come and say, you know, I have this problem at home. We give them counsel, but we don't make decisions for their life. Many years ago, I think it was 2015, where this one pastor one brother from a church, he called me and he said, I'm in big trouble. I said, what happened? The pastor of his church told him to sell his land and give it to the church. And when he does that, God has, he prophesied, God has told him that he'll give double that land what he has sold. So this guy went, he sold his land without his parents' permission. 
got the money, gave it to the church. And he's sitting and waiting for the double blessing. Forget about double blessing. Everything what was there also is gone. And then he calls me. This is what happened. You see, we need to be very careful. We don't interfere into people's personal lives. We are there to support people spiritually. right? So we should be very cautious. Three, do not be condemning, condescending, or self-righteous. What does it mean? When we are ministering to people, don't condemn people. Don't, don't make ridicule them. Don't mock them. Jesus could have done that. See, I have no other option now. Since you are a Samaritan, just give me some water. Don't tell anybody I spoke to you. Just leave it at this. The disciples, will, my friends are coming. I'll go and join them. Don't No. He didn't condemn. He didn't act like he's a self-righteous person. He just acted normal, like a normal person. It's a very important lesson for us to learn. We may be believers for 20 years, act normal. Don't say, hold on, Holy Spirit is talking to me. Let me uh, listen to what he's saying. No, just be normal, even as we minister to people. So how did Jesus impact his life, impact this woman's life? As Jesus engaged with the woman, he released a word of knowledge, revealing something about her past and her present. What did he say? Jesus answered, everyone drinks this water will be thirsty again but whoever drinks of the water i give him will never thirst again go down uh let's go to verse 16. he told her go call your husband and come back and look at the question that jesus is saying you know the command that jesus is giving go call your husband and come now they're talking about water where is this living water give me the living water suddenly jesus then changes the whole conversation. Go call your husband and come. What is the response here? I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is, look at the word of knowledge. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Now, Here's what I believe would have happened. As they are talking about the water, I'll give you living water, all of that. The Holy Spirit would have told Jesus, this is her problem in her life. She's got five husbands. The one she's living with is not even her husband. So how did Jesus bring, up, bring this whole conversation to there? It's a change of topic. Jesus said, go call your husband. And then he spoke that word of knowledge. Right? This affected her powerfully. And she began to ask him questions about where to worship God and about the Messiah. And she met and believed the Lord that day. Let's read on. What happens? So the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Now, the conversation is has been, first it was what? Water. Natural thing. It went into a spiritual thing. I'll give you living water. From living water it went to? Go call your husband, natural. Then Jesus, in the word through word of knowledge, revealed what's in her life, supernatural. Now again, Jesus, uh, the woman is bringing back to the natural, saying, I think you're a prophet. See that you're a prophet. You're able to tell me what's happening in my life and what, what all is happening in my life. Then she brings it back to the supernatural or the spiritual. What does he say? She says, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. So now the woman is saying, you see this mountain there? As Samaritans, we go on that mountain. Now, but you Jews say we should go to the temple in Jerusalem and worship there. What should we do? Look at Jesus' response. Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. For salvation has come from the Jews. Right? So what is Jesus trying to say? See, you are worshiping on the mountain and you don't even know who that God is. We as Jews, we are going to the temple 
and worship, worshiping the God of heaven and earth. So both of us are going to a certain place and worshiping. But a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father and the, in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. And so beautifully. You see what Jesus is doing here? He's not bringing, he's not saying as a Jew he's greater or the God that he's worshiping is greater. He's just saying, see, you people are worshiping on the mountain. We go worship in the temple. But whatever it is, the time is coming when we will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. It's not about a place. It's not about the mountain. It's not about the temple. God is spirit. Those who worship him will worship him in spirit and in truth. And as believers, all of us can be used by God to release the supernatural, the gifts of the spirit, healing, and miracles. Now, what happened after all of this? Let's go down. The woman said, I know that you are the Messiah. Did Jesus say it? Did Jesus say, I'm the Messiah? She understood it. The Holy Spirit brought revelation into her heart and made her self acknowledge this man is the Messiah. Jesus didn't say it. He was just talking spiritual aspects, but she understood it. The woman said, I know that I know that Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to me. Jesus said, I am I I who speak to you am he. As the Messiah, he was able to penetrate as, as a son of God through the Holy Spirit. He was able to penetrate into this person's lives. What is the ripple effect we see here? One woman was powerfully impacted by Jesus was instrumental in bringing that whole village to Christ. She goes about and tells everyone, come and see who I met. The Messiah knew everything about my life. There was a ripple effect. We never know how one life we connect and impact can affect others who will be brought to faith. So when we connect with people, we are also to impact their lives. Now, not always is it going to be easy. Right? Sometimes while we are speaking, we don't know what to say. We don't know how to say it. Well, we may not have the wisdom. OK, they, they are talking something. We don't know how to stir the conversation from the natural to the spiritual. That's all right. But we make an attempt to do that. As we minister to people, as we evangelize, we learn, we apply the learning, we, we learn from our mistakes, and we grow. Right? So it's, it's not a one-time thing where we just snap our fingers and say, I know how to evangelize. It takes time, but we go through that process. Learn from your mistakes. Yes, Pooja has raised her hand. Any question? No, Master, thank you. No, no. OK. All right, any questions otherwise? So how will you connect with people when you go back? Find ways. Right? You can maybe it could be just through an instrument. It could be food. It could be you know songs. It could be a sport. Whatever it is, use that. Connect with people. Remember guitar classes. Through the guitar classes, I was able to bring people to Christ. There's nothing. I didn't go and say, you know, all the gifts are given by God, so this gift is from God. No. Just do things in the natural. Stir conversations. Know when to speak, when not to speak, how to speak. And as we do that, we will learn. Right? So let's get into chapter 8. Quickly, we'll try and finish this chapter as well. Now, chapter 8 is a very, very interesting chapter. Now, all this while we were talking about you know gifts and working of miracles and all of these things. But now in Acts chapter 17, we look at understanding and reason. Now, this is a very, very important chapter because 
as believers, sometimes what we do is we think that ministry is only in the supernatural. Right? Only if there's miracles, only if there's prophecy, only if there's word of knowledge is my ministry good. No. It's not true. We have the word of God. Yes, Jesus did a lot of miracles, all of it. But there are places where you and I must understand just by understanding, reasoning and speaking without any miracles, we can bring people to Christ. Miracles are good. We need them. But we, it's not like we, without miracles, we can't bring people to Christ. Jesus did that, right? Did Jesus do any miracle, the Samaritan woman? No. But did he do miracles in other places? Yes. So you and I must learn to develop both these abilities. The natural of giving a defense for the gospel and also the spiritual. Now, let me give you a background of Acts 17. Acts 17, Paul is on a second missionary journey. He goes into Berea. Berea he has preached. And then they wanted to kill him. So, they, uh, so he quickly moves away and gets into a place called Athens, Acts 17. He goes into a place called Athens. And while in Athens, Paul is moving around in the city. And what is he doing? He's looking around for opportunities to minister. Right? Now let's read a couple of verses. Right? When Paul was, Acts 17, verse 16. When Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Verse 17. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks. Now we got Paul. He, ran, he has run away from Berea because people wanted to kill him. And he's moving, he's walking around in Athens. And he's seeing this, this, this city is full of idols. And his heart was distressed. And he began to reason with the people in the synagogue. What does the word reason mean? The word reason means to, to, to discuss with people. Tell me something. Why are you worshipping this God? What is the reason? So that is reasoning with somebody. If I go to one of, you know, if I'm meeting some of you, I'll say, why did you come to Bible college? I want to know the reason. I'm reasoning with you. Five people may have a certain reason why they came to Bible college. Another five people may have a different reason altogether. Right? So when I reason, I get to know why they are doing something. And so Paul did that. And in Athens, it, now, history says Athens was like, a, it was the capital of Greece, right? And four of the greatest minds came out from this, from this country, from Greece. Socrates, his best student was Aristotle. Aristotle's best student was Plato. Plato's best student was Alexander the Great. For great minds came out from this city. But what is so prevalent in this city, in this place, was there were two kinds of beliefs. One was called the Epicurean, uh, Epicurean belief, and one was the Stoics, two belief systems. So basically, if you look at India, we have different religions, right? In Hinduism uh, or in Christianity, we have different groups, right? We have the Baptists, the Methodists, right? The same way, in Athens, there were two kinds of people, two groups of people, the main religions that were going on there. So let's look at what, what are these two religions about. The Epicureans and the Stoicism. Epicureans followed the teachings of Epicurus that believed that everything happened by chance and death was the end of all. They believed that gods were remote from this world and did not care and believed that pleasure was the end of man. Right? So look at this belief system. Epicureans, they believe that uh, you know, gods were remote from this world. That means there are gods, they're away from this world. right? And they did not care about us as human beings. And pleasure was the end. If you have pleasure in life, you have received everything that you need in life. That was their belief system. Look at the Stoics. The Stoics believed that everything was God and that God was a fiery spirit inside them. 
Epicurean said God is somewhere else. They didn't care about God. Stoic said God is inside them as a fiery spirit. Right? And uh, that is what the spirit, that is the spark that gave life to man. And when they died, that spark returned to God. And that everything that was happening was a will of God. And one day this world will disintegrate and the whole cycle will again start off, you know, where creation comes, children, like, you know, human beings, that whole creation will start again. So two different kinds of beliefs. But these were the two main beliefs. Now, Paul is going there. In Acts 17, I'll just summarize what's happening. So he goes and he begins to speak to people. Now, verse 18, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? He seems to be advocating some foreign gods. What is, what is he saying? This guy has come from another place. He's a Jew. And he's talking about, you know, somebody came into this world, they died on the cross, and then after he died on the cross, he took all our sins, and then he rose from the dead, and now he's gone to heaven. What is this guy saying? We don't understand him. All I know is God is a fiery spirit. He lives inside of us. When we die, that spark will be, go join with him, and one day the world will disintegrate. But this is some new teaching. God sent his son into this world and, you know, there was a cross. And so they said, what, are, what, is, what is this guy speaking about? He goes on. So they said, they said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Aeropagus where they said to him, may we know what this teaching is that you are presenting. Because you are bringing strange ideas to our ears. So now these Greeks are saying, this is a new philosophy, new teaching. We don't have any other work. So Paul, you tell us, explain to us what you're preaching. You are bringing some strange, verse 21, 22. Then Paul stood up in the meeting of the Aeropagus. Now, let me, let me share what is this. The word Aeropagus, right? It's, it's a, you know, when two people, it's like a court case, right? It's, it's like a place of court. And here, if two people have a problem with each other, what happens is they would have their meetings over there, right? Uh, so it was a place where uh, law, any problems, everything was resolved in this place. It's like the center of the marketplace. So they said to Paul, you come and speak there. Okay. So now Paul then stood up in the meeting in Aeropagus and said, men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. What is the first thing Paul is doing? He's bringing out the fact that they are very religious. He's, he's encouraging, exhorting them. You know, religious people. Very good. Right. Then he says, for I walked around and looked and I saw that, there was, that I, there's an inscription to an unknown God. Now, what you worship as unknown, let me bring you, let me proclaim to you what is that unknown God. You see what Paul is doing here? Very powerful. He's saying, see, you all are very religious people. Very good. That means you all are searching for a God. And you don't know who's this God. But now I've come here and I will explain to you who this God is. He used their setting to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ into their midst. Then he goes on to preach from verse 24 onwards. He goes all the way to verse 31. He's preaching the gospel, right? Uh, and then in verse 32, when they heard about the resurrection of the dead, this is the response of what they heard. Some of them snared, but the others said, we want to hear you again on this matter. So some of them said, this guy has gone mad. They sneered at him. They said, you're talking foolishness. But the others said, no, no, no. We want to hear some more of you. So there were three reactions. Some of them disbelieved and said, you're a foolish man. Some, the others said, no, we want to listen some more. Thirdly, look at the third response. At that, Paul left the council 
a few men became followers of Paul and believed. And among them was Dionysus, a member of the Aeropagus, and a woman named Damaris and a few others. Now think of this. Paul has just preached. How many minutes he would have taken to preach this? Verse 24 to verse 31. Three minutes, gospel in three minutes, he finished. There were three reactions. One was rejection. Second, they wanted to hear him more. Third, people, people believed him and followed him and the church was planted there. And these were not some people. They were people who were sitting, members of the Aeropagus. People with great intellect, they were listening and they believed in this gospel. So now let us look at how the Apostle Paul did this. Firstly, he recognized where people are in their spiritual quest. So people are looking for a God. I will bring it to them. I will show them who's the God. He used something they relate to and understand as a starting point. So what did he say? See, I was walking around and I saw a statue to an unknown God. You have it. You have a statue to an unknown God. So now let me reveal who that God is. What did he do? He used something they can relate to and they can understand. And he bring the gospel to them. So how can you and I do it? We we'll learn more uh, in, when we are ministering to a Muslim and a Hindu. Where we can use some things that they relate to and point them to Christ. We can do it. Especially most in the Islamic faith, there is so much that they relate to. You can take it and bring it, bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. Right? Then, thirdly, let them know that you have made an effort to know and understand what they believe. Look at Acts 17, verse 28. In verse 28, it says, Paul is preaching, he's saying, um, as your own poets have said, we are his offsprings. So that means what? Paul has made an effort to find out about... Now, remember, there's no Google and all at that time. Paul didn't take out his phone and say, what religion is in Athens? We can do that now. But he made an effort to find out what belief system they have. How did he do that? Maybe he went about uh, talking to people and he said, what do you people believe in? Ah, we have a poet, and he says that we are God's offspring. Ah, thank you. As he was preaching here, what did he say? Your own poets have said that we are God's offspring. So what did he do? He, you, he, he made an effort to help them know that, hey, he knows about us also. It's not like he's just simply talking. So when you and I are ministering to a Hindu or a Muslim, make an effort to know what their religion is. Just at least the basics. Right? What their belief system is, life, death, about sin, whatever. Make an effort to learn about it. Now, that's an effort we must take. Now, the moment we make that effort, people will recognize it. Oh, he knows. So we can at least talk more about it, or we, we give we are given an opportunity to you know involve and speak more, and uh, you know, the discussion can prolong, and eventually we can bring them to Christ. Finally. He shared the message of Christ. Very clear, very succinct, not exaggerating, very important. Paul didn't preach about his life journey. He didn't say, you know what happened? I was on the road to Damascus. I wanted to kill all the Christians. Then this happened. Those people are saying, fast, go tell fast. And he's telling one whole story. He realized, this is my, my opportunity. I have a few minutes. He brought the gospel. And the result was shown. Right? What was the outcome? Three. We talked about that, right? Three. Three results. Some people criticized. Some people said, we want to hear more. Some people believed. A church was established in that place. Now, just a few additional insights. When you and I are ministering to people, always bring in the cross. Bring in the work of the cross. Bring in what Jesus did. Because that is the power of the cross. Don't rely on your own 
testimonies and don't rely on your own words. Rely on the cross. It is it's the best thing to do. Just talk about the cross and leave it. Because the, it's the power of the cross. The results, God will do it. We do our part. So bring in the cross. Two, we reason, understand reason, but remember, reasoning cannot alone do it. We must also depend for the work of the Holy Spirit, signs, wonders, and miracles. Yes. Now, for example, if I'm talking to a person who is a Muslim sheikh, right, a, a, a priest in Islam, in the Islamic faith, now I can't always. I'll need to understand reason with him, but I must also depend on the supernatural because they believe in the supernatural. They believe in miracles. 40 days they fast. They believe that miracles happen during Ramadan. That's their thing. That's why they fast. right? So if you talk about miracles, it's something that they will be able to relate to. right? Then do not get into meaningless arguments and debates. Very important. As you are debating with people, you're sharing the gospel, people will accept you, people will reject you, people may ask questions, they want to know more. But the moment you feel it's going into a meaningless debate, going into argument, just step off. Stop the conversation. Why? Because we are not, we are not having this debate so that I win the argument. No. We're having the debate so that we can bring the person to Christ. That's our end goal. When you when you realize that it's going to a heated argument, you are getting upset, they are getting upset, stop the conversation, move on. Right? Choose another time and a season to do it. Right. So just a few points of while understanding Hindus and Muslims. Uh, we'll talk more about this in the next few chapters. Uh, I think in chapter 10 as well. Uh, chapter, sorry. Yeah, chapter 14, sharing with a Hindu and a Muslim. So we'll leave that out for now. We have chapter 14 and 15. We'll talk about uh, points to emphasize when we are ministering to a Hindu and a Muslim. Right. So we'll stop here. Uh, just to just a note. Um, so I know that we are uh, traveling for mission. So next Tuesday, uh, I will not be here. There won't be class. But what I'll do is I'll record my session because there's a lot of uh, content to follow. I'll record my session and I'll probably post it uh, on the stream. You can go through the session and go through the class because on Tuesday morning I'm traveling. So uh, is that OK? Right? So we'll catch up. Uh, all of you are coming for the youth missions? Yeah, OK. So then we'll catch up after the youth missions uh, and we'll try and complete the portions. Right. All right, thank you. Have a good week ahead. God bless.